afternoon at least from maryland usa it is good afternoon and we are running about 90 degrees today um i just came back from the swimming pool unfortunately i wish i were still there because it's 78 degrees in my house so my air conditioning isn't loving me and the lights are on me so you see sweat pouring down my face that's why so i hope you're uh, ready for this case um this uh, people have asked me um how many cases that you talk about, Pat, have you actually worked on yourself? And many times I do commentary on cases that I've been interested in and have reviewed whatever is publicly available. Sometimes the police files are publicly available, uh, but I will review whatever is available and, and make de determinations uh, based on that. And then there are cases that I have worked around the United States with police departments where I've had total access to the police cases. And um, I'm going to be getting into that here. And this is a case which is a fairly well-known case in some ways. And um, other people in the country and the U.S. do not are, are unfamiliar with all the details of it. And it is going to be one of the most fascinating cases I will ever present because this is a an instance where the police department, the prosecution, and the media, in my opinion, colluded in uh, presenting us with a, a suspect who did not commit the crime, uh, who was convicted of the crime, and everybody cheered and went home happy uh, because they don't like this guy. And, and let me point out something that does happen. Another question people have asked me is, uh, how many cases have you worked where somebody else other than who you thought did it was arrested? And I will say in an entirety, five cases. And what's interesting about this is many times when a profiler works on a case, um, it's not that it is not that I'm telling you who did it. I'm telling you for the detectives when I'm working with the detectives, which way to look, where, where should you, where should you, um, what, what leads should you follow? I may not say I know an exact person who did it, but here's what you should follow. Here's what the evidence shows. Then there are cases where I say, here's the leads I think you should follow. Here's the evidence I think is out there. And here is the guy I think should be your number one suspect. And maybe here's a person I think should be number two suspect based on evidence. Um, in five cases, I pointed out what I consider number one suspects. Um, and in five cases I've worked, there, there have been five people convicted who were not my number one suspects. Not that they were necessarily not matching our profile or, or my, my analysis, but they were not the person I think did it. And interestingly enough, in each time that somebody was prosecuted, found and convicted of the crime I think they did not commit, there was no real evidence to convict them. Now, you may think that there's always got to be a lot of evidence. Sometimes there isn't. It could be a plea bargain. It could be, usually here's the thing. They, if they're going to, if somebody's going to be a fall guy, he's usually a creep. <laughs> he's somebody nobody cares about. Nobody even likes. Uh, in other words, uh, let's say you've got a, a sexual homicide, but you don't have, you don't know who did it. But hey, you've got this guy in prison who's been there for like four different rapes. He's a serial rapist. And he's going to be in there for life. And oh gosh, you know, now he's he. It's said that he did this also this this particular homicide. Does anybody care? Not really. We're just you know, hey, he's already in there for life. He he's a rapist, you know. Of course he did it. Or he's some kind of guy who's just a creepy dude who commits a lot of different kinds of crimes, and nobody really minds that he's not in the neighborhood anymore. It's like oh good, he's gone. But it isn't necessarily the guy who did it. And sometimes juries will be easily convinced to convict a guy who is a creepy psychopathic guy uh, and they'll put him away and nobody will question it. Um, and I've seen this happen and I've never objected to the fact that somebody might be convicted that I didn't think did, I didn't think was the guy, but the evidence proved it. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's interesting. They found enough evidence. It's that guy, not the one I thought. But what I've seen is these guys get convicted and there's almost no shred of evidence to actually convict them. Well, here we are today with that particular case. This is the case 
that is known as Superbike Motorsports Mass Murder. Now, this guy over here, that's Todd Kolop. Now, Todd Kolop, what happened was a number of years ago, um, <laughs> Todd Kolop was found with a woman in the backyard in a container. A woman he had kidnapped, a woman he had restrained in that container and had raped. Um, he not only had done that, but he had also kidnapped her boyfriend who he murdered. Uh, he also kidnapped two, another couple and murdered both of them. So there was no question that this creepy dude who was a, and let me, let me say this straight up for anybody who doesn't understand what I'm going to about to talk about when I'm talking about the other crime that he supposedly committed. Todd Kolop is a serial killer. He is a violent psychopath. He is a pathological liar, a manipulator. He is the creepiest guy of the nth degree. I'm not defending him in any way. He deserves to be, he deserved a death penalty, which he got out of, by the way, when he confessed to the crime I'm going to talk about today. He got a plea deal to confess to the, the one I'm right above me, the Superbike Motorsports mass murder where four people were murdered in an afternoon. Uh, he confessed to that and it was like 13 years later after he was already caught for the serial homicides, lo and behold, suddenly he confessed to the mass murder as well. And um, by doing so, he got out of the death penalty and only got a life sentence for the murders he committed. And the claim was that a it, it, it helped the families of the murder victims because they didn't have to go to court and suffer through you know the misery of going to court and having to hear all this nonsense uh, you know about what they, what he did to their 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 children it was, you know the brutality they didn't have to sit through that I agree that's that's pleasant uh, and then at the same hand uh, the people who the families of the four murder victims of the uh, superbike motorsports mass murder also didn't have to go to court. So isn't that great? I mean, this horrible serial killer who is unquestionably a serial killer, there's hands down tons of proof. I mean, the bodies were buried on his property and the girl was in his container truck in the, back, the container, not the truck, the container on the back of his property. There's no question. Todd Cole is a serial killer of the nth degree. We don't even know if all of the crimes he's committed have been discovered. He claims there's lots more, but then he's a liar, so we don't know. Uh, but did he commit the superbike mass murder? And this is where it gets very interesting because this is what almost nobody knows about. And do you know why? Because the police, the prosecution, and the media all colluded to keep the story the way they wanted it, which was oh, look, isn't it an unusual thing that a serial killer is also a mass murderer? That's almost unheard of. As a matter of fact, famed criminal profiler John Douglas, who commented on this case, and I'll get to that later, also said, it's unheard of. You know why it's unheard of? Because he didn't do it. That's why it's unheard of. And I'm going to prove it in this particular uh, video. So please have some patience. I'm going to start by trying to explain how this all went down so you can understand a little bit more about why Todd Cola became the suspect and why he got convicted because it's a lot there. For once, I will say there was corruption. I don't usually accuse a police department of corruption. I will accuse this one of corruption. Um, not everybody in the department, mind you. Um, there's good detectives in the Spartanburg Sheriff's uh, County uh, Depart uh, Department. There's good people there. Um, I, I don't ever have a broad brush and say, no, oh, everybody he's there is awful. No, that's not true. So what I'm going to say is that there are some people at work. Number one, the sheriff of this particular department um, who are responsible for what I consider corruption um, and malfeasance. Uh, and I will stand by that. Um, and if they want to take me to court over that boogie, bully for them, I will, I will, I will face them in that court because I do not think that is libelous because I can prove it is not, and I'll prove it right now. Um, so, in this particular case, and I also want to point out what a lot of times people think that if there is malfeasance, if there is somebody who's put away who really didn't do it, they think it's because the police are covering up for one of their own. 
Um, most of the time, that's not true. Uh, it just may be expedient, politically expedient. And I believe that th what, that was the, most of the case here, politically expedient. I think there was incompetence in the beginning. And there's no question about that. That has been proved there was some incompetence. Um, there was the theory that one of the suspects did have a relative in the police department. And while that may have colored some people's thinking to the fact that they just, you know, you don't, don't think as hard in that direction if you know they're related to somebody you know, that's possible. But I think in the long run, the real issue was that um, that the police department wanted to put this case to bed, especially the sheriff who was running for office. And when, as he pointed out, he, he prayed because he keeps saying you pray because he's a really religious man. He prayed and he, his prayers were answered. And I bet they were with Todd Colhep. Yeah, they were. And uh, after he went off and had a little chat with Todd and gave him three wishes, as they say, he's like a genie out of a bottle. Oddly enough, this guy confessed. So how, does this all work out? Now, I just want to double check with everybody. Are you are you hearing me clearly before I go into all the the all the issues? I just don't want to leave anybody behind here. Just somebody say I can hear you, and then I'm I'm, I'm good. Uh, just to make sure. Somebody, Amber, can you hear me? Clara, can you hear me? <laughs> Already, okay. Christine said she can hear me, so none of you all have to say anything anymore. Okay, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a very short description of what happened. Um, with it, it, this is such a there's so much evidence in this case. Thank you, Claire. We're good. We're good. Okay. Thank you, Jen. We're good. All right. There's so much evidence in this case, so much that I'm having trouble watering it down. However, later on, if you're confused, or you wonder what I actually said or how what else you missed. You can go to the description below and you can click on that. And there is a link to my blogs. And in one of the blogs I put up there, there's a link to 10 more blogs and you can find information there. Um, also, please, before I forget, please uh, do like this video. Please do subscribe to the channel. Please do share my channel with other people or this particular video. And, um, and please click the little bell for notifying in the future so that I can keep up with you all. All right, now let's get to... This is going to this very, very interesting case. All right. So let's go to who this this um I'm sorry, who, here we are. This is this is uh this is a location of um in, in um, a place called Chesney, South Carolina. Um this is the mo this is the Superbike Motorsports location. This is a motorcycle shop. Uh, and in the shop were these four people the day that this all went down. Now um, let me explain who these people are to you. And I've got notes here because, I've, as I pointed out, I've got so many notes. I'm trying to keep track of it myself. Uh, okay, here is basically the information. The murdered were Scott Ponder. That's this gentleman here. He was the owner of the shop, Scott Ponder. Now, the woman next to him, this is Beverly Guy. That is his mother. Now, Scott ran the shop. Beverly Guy did a lot of the, you know, secretarial trip did all the money stuff. She had a bad, there was an office in there. She did a lot of work in the office. Um, and then we have, let me move back. This is Brian Lucas. This is Scott Ponder's best friend. Um, he was a, uh, he was his, the, the manager of the shop essentially. And over here, we have a fairly new guy to the shop. He'd only been there a little bit, short period of time. His name is Chris Sherbert. He was a mechanic and he did a lot of the work on the, on the, on the, uh, on the bikes in the back cleaning them up, getting them ready, you know, any problems with the bikes, he would, he would work on them. So that's basically it. Now, here's what happened. Someone came in during the business day, middle of the day, and shot them all dead. And there were no witnesses as to who the shooter was. So all of them were shot down in the middle of the day. Uh, nobody survived. And, um, and it was it really stunned the community because nobody could figure out why. Because as far as everybody's concerned, these were these were not these were great good people, good people. Uh, there, there, there's been all kinds of little theories. Oh my God, maybe the Mexican drug cartel is involved. No, uh, there's no such evidence that drugs ever went through this place. That there was anything squirrely going on. These are people who ran a business and like like motorbikes. I mean that's that's basically it. So all right. So now now after so this goes on and. Nothing comes of it. But here is the next thing that happens. So now we have this guy. All right. 
on your on over here this is the sheriff his name is chuck wright i call him chuck wrong but hey chuck wright uh chuck wright really really wanted in the beginning i'm not saying he didn't want to catch the guy he did uh i mean this was this was a this was, this was a big issue so uh, this is a huge case in the count, county. Nothing's been like it uh, in Spartanburg. Uh, so the sheriff's department wanted to solve this crime, and I'm not saying they didn't work hard on it. Mistakes were made, but I give a little bit of, you know, hey, you know, everybody makes mistakes sometimes. Now, over here is a guy they called the person of interest. This was their suspect. Now, I'm sorry, I have my, my dosages today. I don't know what's going on here. Ah, man, maybe it's the heat. But anyway, or it's a swimming pool. I think it's chlorine. Uh, so if I itch my nose a lot, that's why. Okay, so this, this, this. There was a, there was a witness, and I, let me, let me explain this a little bit. A little confusing. There, there was a witness. Oh, by the way, yes, Amber is correct on that one. Uh, Amber says they put one of the wives through hell. Af also, after this happened, yes, they did. What happened was there was a mix-up in uh, some samples of blood, and um, apparently the, the wife of Scott Ponder. Uh, was accused of having an affair with the best friend, the manager, <laughs> which wasn't true. <laughs> Never happened, but they mixed up stuff. So it, it, it was it was quite unbelievable. However, again, I'm just I'm I'm going to say if somebody doesn't do something purposefully to be to be deceptive, I'm going to give them a break. As you know, things happen. I mean, we'd love to believe that everything is competent all the time, but you know, we all make mistakes in our jobs, all of us. So. Yes, that was not a good thing. However, it wasn't on purpose. Okay, so now look. So now this dude, so there was a witness there. And the witness saw this guy during business hours before it all cleared out. This some guy came in and was sitting on a motorcycle and checking it out. And this is where that, this this description, this, this composite came from. Now, interesting enough, that same witness like years later came back and said, oh, I, I got a better description now. I'm like, your, your memory does not get better. It gets worse. So that you would come back years later and have a better description is really questionable. So anyway, this is what they focused on over and over and over. Just this guy. This is the guy who did it. And actually, let me find the statement that uh, Chuck, uh, Chuck Wright said. He actually said, as I said, there's so much evidence here. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, where is that? He basically said that this is absolutely the guy. And this is what got me to speak up in this particular case. Um, because I got real upset when he, when Chuck Wright went and said, this absolutely is the guy, because there's no evidence to support that this was the guy. What we had here was a guy who was uh, checking out a bike and supposedly some paperwork was started and then the bike was taken in the back and, and the mechanic was working on it. And this is Chuck Wright's theory on this. The guy never came forward. Well, you know, and you told me the only reason the guy wouldn't come forward is because in our neck of the woods, all our people are so wonderful that not one of them would have not come forward if they it hadn't been them and they hadn't committed the crime. I'm going to say this. How many of you might say, you know, <laughs> nobody knows it's me and I'm like damned if I'm going to go to the police and say I was the guy sitting on there when they're saying I'm the person of interest. Suspect in murdering four people. I'm going to say a good portion of people will hide in their basement rather than ever do that. Um, secondly, not everybody doesn't have a criminal record. You know, this the guy who was buying a motorbike might have, maybe he was involved in drugs, maybe a little criminal record. Last thing he wants to do is deal with the police. So I, I, I said this to Chuck Wright. I said, come on now. <laughs> Your town is not different from every other town in the entire United States. There are many people would not come forward. And he insisted, oh, no. He didn't come forward because he is the guy, which is an absolutely ridiculous statement to begin with right there. Now, now it gets even, it gets more and more complicated. So, um, <laughs> so I, I went public with this. I did. And let me find you the statement after I went public with that. This was unreasonable to say so. Um, oh, uh, let, let me, let me point this out before I do that. Just what was the general General, um, this is this is uh, John Douglas. John Douglas did a profile of this case. Everybody knows John Douglas is being a very famous uh, retired FBI profiler. He did a, by the way, you see the, uh, over here, you'll see this sort of profile. I don't know if he wrote it up for this television show he did, but I was told 
that he never actually spent time with the department and sat down with the evidence, that he never sat there and went through everything, that he basically had lunch. And they asked him over lunch, uh, what do you think happened? But gave him an idea. And he said, well, you know, since nothing was stolen, which is true, not one thing was stolen. There was money there. There was equipment there. Nothing was stolen. Nothing was touched. Um, so he said it wasn't a robbery, which it definitely wasn't. Uh, and then he said, you know, it, it has to be like a pissed off employee or a customer because, you know, nothing was stolen. Uh, and I'll agree with that. However, Usually, if you've got a pissed off customer, one of the things you have is, first of all, pissed off customers don't usually wipe out the entire place. Um, kill every employee there just because they're they're mad that what? They lost some money. And usually, if they're that pissed off about losing money, they might actually take some with them. Uh, but that didn't happen. Also, there were, there were no reports of phone calls or visitation by anybody in the months prior to this where somebody was like upset. There was no sign of that. And usually when people get upset, they don't wait a long time to come back and get y'all. I mean, they don't say, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just put this off for a few years. They, they, they usually get mad. They make a bunch of phone calls. Hey, you know, you ripped me off, blah, blah, blah. They come in there, you know, feet on the table, you know, you, you thieves, bunch of thieves. Then they do something. This didn't happen. This didn't happen. So I do. I never believed that this was a, an irate customer. Uh, that made no sense to me. Um, and there was nobody in, uh, that had worked there who should have been an irate ex-employee either. So my belief was this was personal because you had somebody come in there and purposely kill everybody in the vehicle, the store, and then walk out and take nothing. I believed it was personal, some kind of revenge thing, but personal. So anyway. John Douglas gave this little thing here. And then um, a little while later, what the public heard was this about me, because I wrote about how I thought that this whole thing about this one guy was the guy that um, this was, this was, uh, this was nonsense. Um, let's see if I can find this one little, oh, nope, that's not it. Okay. Where did it go? Okay. Things are, I hate it when things go missing, it annoys me so much. Um, and I do think it's gone missing. So I'm going to have to just tell you about it. So, um, so whoops, that's not what I want you to see and not yet. Okay. So let me go back and go back here. Okay. So at any rate, what happened was after I spoke up the sheriff, well, let me go back and show you Mr. Sheriff again. Okay. Let's go back to sheriff. Uh, this is Sheriff Chuck Wright. He actually came forward and said, that um oh that pat brown that lady she only knows what she read on the internet he said that he said this on camera that i only knew about this case from what i had read on the internet so i came forward and i wrote three blogs and they were called i read it on the internet <laughs> and um I read it on the internet, number one. I read it on the internet, number two. I read it on the internet, number three. Super bike murders, I read it on the internet. And during, when I wrote the blogs, I actually put through the entire blog. And as I read on the internet, this and this and this happened. And as I read on the internet, that and that and that happened. And it, there were some people who had no clue why this was going on. And they're going, what's wrong with this woman writing these blogs? Why does she keep saying? And I read it on the internet. And I read it on the internet. Well, eventually, I forced... Sheriff Chuck Wright to come forward and have to admit, no, she didn't read it on the internet. She worked with us and she had inside, she did come down here and spend 50 hours. I had spent one week in Spartanburg at the request of the Sheriff's Department. I went down to Spartanburg County Sheriff's Department and I sat in their room and they brought me the evidence, boxes and boxes of paperwork, reports and all that. And I sat there and I reviewed the evidence in their in their facility for 50 hours. In other words, five days worth. I spoke with the detectives, I hung out with the detectives. I got a gold coin actually from, oh, here, a gold coin from our, our department. Everything was pretty good. Um, except that during that time, um, I asked some questions that people couldn't answer and, or didn't want to answer. And uh, then I left and I sent my, I sent my analysis of the case in 
which by the way is not public, um, the actual analysis of the profile of the case. Uh, and apparently they didn't want to deal with it. So they just let it, they just basically put it away. And I, I, I didn't say anything about it. I never said I was even down there until after I'd done all that work, this guy comes out and puts his person of interest up and says, this is the guy when clearly it was not the guy. So I spoke up and said it wasn't. And then Sheriff Chuck Wright came out and said, she doesn't know anything. She only read it on the internet, and which was a blatant lie. And I called them on it by writing these blogs and just obviously showing I didn't read it on the internet. And then he came back and just and trashed me, but admitted, yes, she did work with us. <laughs> so now let's go with this. We already have a questionable human being here, a questionable uh, a government employee. He is, we, we hire him. We, we, and you know, people vote him into office and there's a lot of people who love this guy, Chuck, Chuck, right. But I'm going to say once a liar, always a liar. And he lied about me on video, on camera for the news media. And if you're willing to get on the camera in front of the news media and blatantly lie like that, what is it about you that we should trust? And I'm going to say not a whole hell of a lot. So, all right. So, I did work with the smart, uh, with, the, with, the, with the department. Now, let's let's find out what happened with this particular case. Okay, now this gets okay. Let me see. There was a huge, I say, over focus on this one guy who I did not believe did it. Um, so, by the way, why didn't I believe this guy did it? Well, let's see. Okay, uh, there wasn't any shred of evidence that proved he did it. That's the number one. But let's let me take a look at my notes here. There was not one witness to the crime to say that the man in the composite was involved, nor were there any statements about this man in the composite made that would indicate anyone saw him elsewhere tossing a gun or speeding off in a car, and no one has heard of a man of the description talking about the involvement in the crime. And what was this suspicious man doing? Looking at a motorcycle and trying to decide if he was going to buy it. Oh my God, what a crime. Uh, now, that they said it was terribly suspicious that the uh, owner didn't have his name written down on the paperwork, Ooh, like he was hiding his ad identity. Have you ever heard of a hard sell? That's where you go, hey, you know, let me let me write down some information here, and uh, you know, why don't you take a look at it, and we'll, we'll clean it up, and maybe you know, if you want it, we can we no, then we can fill out the rest of the paperwork, and then you can sign it. I mean, I'm not going to put my name on paperwork until I'm really sure I want to get it, but I have seen places start filling stuff out to try to encourage you like, yeah, we're on our way, we're on our way. That that could simply be what it is. Um, now, so, so this is where when I came in to work on the case, I was told that it was this guy and that it was probably some price gouging thing going on, which I didn't, I didn't buy. That would be the big reason for going in there and knocking everybody off. Now, let me tell you what they told me how this went down. Now, you're going to have to kind of imagine this because I do have crime scene photos. I will not put the crime scene photos up uh, on, on YouTube here, um, nor, will I, or, nor will I provide my profile, but I will tell you about the whole thing. And you can read great details about it in, in the, if you go down and click on the blog and go through all the blogs, but I'm not going to show you the actual crime scene stuff. So, but I'm going to describe it to you well enough so you can you have to start putting it in your head. And I'm going to describe it in a number of different ways. Right now, what, what, the, what the sheriff's office determined happened, or let's say they, just, they put out that happened. Then I'll put out what I believe happened. And why do I know what I think believe, I believe happened? Because I was there and I looked at all the evidence, not because I made it up off of the internet. Uh, and then we have Todd Kolep coming in and giving his little um, his, uh, confession of what happened. And it's very, very interesting. And this, and you'll have to be a little patient. I have, in the end, I have this, which I'm going to share with you, the false confession of Todd Kolop. And I have in here, I have in here a whole bunch of reasons why he lied. I mean, I have one piece of evidence after the other, after the other, and I will get to that. But I want you to understand how it all went down to know why Todd Kolop could give a confession that he did and uh, why it was believed by some people. Okay, so what exactly happened? This is what this is what the police said happened. Okay, 
All right. They believe that the killer came in the back door of the, the, uh, of the business where the mechanic was working. They believe that he came in the back door and he shot the mechanic. Then he came through some swinging doors toward the front and, and the, the mother, uh, Beverly Guy, came out of a back room or a bathroom or wherever. She came out of, in front of him and he shot her. Then after he shot her, the owner, Scott Ponder, and his, the manager, Brian Lucas, made a, made a beat. They ran for the front door to try to get out of there and he shot them too. Now, there is claim that they shot seven, 17 rounds. Okay. And then one of the things they asked me is, do you think that the, 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 uh, the, the killer mixed up his ammunition? Like he, he, there were, there were two clips and he put like in one, he put, he mixed, he just had this like bowl of, of brass and bowl of nickel, different ammunition. And he just grabbed a bunch and some were brass, some were nickel. And then he had two clips. Do I think that happened? They asked me this question because they wondered why certain thing, why certain people were shot with certain, certain particular ammunition. They never really explained it. They just thought it was all mixed up. That's what, that's what they're, that's what they told me, which made no sense. Um, and then, um, so the shooter mixed his ammunition at 11. This is my point important. 11, uh, nickel casings. Some people call them silver casings and there were seven brass casings. So those were on the floor near the victims. And he shot the victims from the back of the store all the way to the front of the store. And everybody except uh, everybody ended up with a bullet in the head that had a brass casing, except for Beverly Guy. She had a uh, it was supposedly nickel casing. Now, I will say this. There's some very shifty things about some of the way the information was released. So there could be something a little off here. So I'm just going to put that out there. OK, so that was their theory. They were adamant that the shooter came in the back door and that shot Chris Sherbert. That was the. That was the mechanic who was cleaning up a motorcycle, went to the swinging door, then shot Beverly Guy, the mother, and then shot Brian Lucas and Scott Ponder. The 18 round. I thought it was seven. Why do I have her? I'm sorry. I've just got something's messed up here in my rounds here. Uh, anyway, the uh, that he had to change clips. Now, I, th I thought this was really weird. Uh, he's basically saying that in the midst of shooting the three people in the front room, the guy changed clips and then kept going, which made no sense to me. The magazines were changed in the middle of shooting, which, you know, people are running away. You don't really want to have to do that. So I'll, I'll explain later why that's not true. Okay. And then everybody ended up except for Beverly with brass casing, my bullets from the brass casing. Da, 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 da. Anyway. Okay. It gets very confusing. So you have to really read through it. Um, I believe I believe the killer had a full 10 round magazine um, with nickel, nickel plated uh, cartridges and one in the chamber that would give 10 plus one. So I don't know if, it, if you don't use guns, what happens is you get, you've got, you've got your, um, you know, you got your magazine and then you put all your, your bullets in there and then you can put it in the gun. And if you want one in the chamber, you, 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 go and and then one goes into the chamber and then you can take the magazine out and add one more to it. So that way you end up with 10 in the magazine and one in the chamber. You don't have, they don't have to then you get to shoot. So it makes it faster and you have more ammunition. So I believe there were 11. Okay. And then, then he changed. Then he changed when he ran out of the 11, then he changed. That's my belief. Okay. So now, then he changed the other one, which happened to be nickel. I mean, sorry, that happened to be brass. So he started. Um, so there's. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting confused here myself. It's so confused. It's so convoluted that I have to try to go back through this. I will explain it all later. Okay. So, anyway, I, I thought this was nonsense. So here's what I here here's what um, I'm going to explain the, the the whole casing thing later on because it's just I'll, I'll explain it when when um, I talk about how. Uh, uh, Todd Kolop, his claims of what happened, and then I have a very clear explanation of what really happened. Um, so anyway, so ignore that for now because it's just it's just it's hard to explain to you right now. So anyway, here was my question. So the guy is mad at the place, right? Why would he go in the? Uh, you could say why would he go in the back? Because if you go in the back, if 
by the time you get to the front, somebody, uh, another person could have pulled in there. It could be another customer coming in the door and then you wouldn't know they're there. And if you're mad at the people in the front, why not kill them first and then go to the back? Why even bother with the guy in the back for that matter? You know what I mean? Uh, because he's just a kid. You know what I mean? He has nothing to do with running the business. But OK, let's assume he did go in the back and then he shot the mechanic and then he then he came forward and shot everybody else. If you didn't know who's in the front room, why not just pass by the mechanic, shoot everybody in the front and then go back and shoot the guy in the back? I mean, th the way they described it is something that I say, this makes no sense. OK, so here's what I think actually happened. OK, I'm going to do a quick run of what I think happened, and then we're going to go on to uh, why Todd Kolop didn't do it. The behaviors of the victims indicate that Beverly Guy was shot first. If the killer had been intent on shooting Ponder or Lucas first and pulled out a gun in the front room, he would have likely shot the men where they stood, considering how close the man was to the two men. However, the killer shot them only after they were in motion, running toward the front door in order to escape. Something clearly set them off, and this would be the shooting of Guy, Beverly Guy. I believe he pointed the gun at Guy's face and she turned her head, causing him to shoot her in the right side of the head. She fell and he shot her then. Uh, so he shot, shot one was a nickel casing, nickel to the head. Uh, shot two was to her chest. Okay, and then the men made a break for it. Shots three and four. That was a nickel casings again. That's the silver stuff. I always, sometimes I get confused what, what the colors things are. So the nickel one is a is, is silver one. Uh, so three and four were shot. The next shot hit, hits Brian Lucas in the backside, causing him to collapse in the door. And then Scott Ponder, who's the owner, leaps over him. And then there's numerous shots to Ponder's back, take him down to the ground. And those are all nickel shots. Call them silver if you want to. Nickel, silver. That's what they look like, silver color. So Beverly Guy was shot, boom, boom, with silver. Then Brian Lucas and, 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 and Scott Ponder run to the door. And he shoots again, three, four, boom, boom. And he keeps shooting, boom, 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 boom. After he... Scott Ponder hits the ground. He runs out of ammunition. At this point, he switches magazines to brass ammunition. Now, at this point, the shooter knows there's one more person in the back that he needs to deal with. And he probably knows this because he knows the shop well. He turns and go, walks through the swinging doors into the work area. There's music on in both the front and back, so it's questionable as to whether Chris Sherbert, that's the mechanic in the back, uh, knew that what had happened. It is possible he did hear the shots, but by the time he realized what was going on, the shooter had already entered the back of the shop. The shooter sh fired as soon as he came through the swinging door, approximately from the area of three bikes to the left of the door. He started shooting coming through the door. The, and there's two, two brass casings back there. Again, where he's changed. Remember, the first was all nickel, which looks like silver, all the way up to the front of the place. Then he changes the... Changes the magazine. He's going through the swinging doors. He shoots brass, brass. The trajectory is perfect in perfect line with the back storage room where the bullets went through the boxes. Pay attention to this. The bullets went through the boxes. There is proof of this. So wait till, wait till you hear Todd Culhep's confession, which doesn't match this at all. Uh, so the bullets go through there, and there's evidence of that. The shooter's position would be in the general area where there was a crescent wrench. Sherbert was was behind the miter cycle, and there was a wrench that was thrown at the at the door. Uh, and he would have thrown at the shooter in a desperate attempt to stop him. This is evidence is proof. This evidence is proof that Sherbert did see him coming, and that the shooter was coming at him from the swinging doors. He was the final victim, not the first victim. Sherbert likely was ducking behind the motorcycle he was working on as he saw the killer coming toward him with a gun. The killer then moved in on Sherbert, who had no way to stand up from behind the motorcycle and run out the bay door without getting shot. The shooter came over him and shot him in the back and in the chest, brass, cat, brass casings, and then capped him with a shot to the top of the head. Okay? Brass casing again. All right. The shooter then returned to the front of the business to make sure Brian and Scott were dead. It is during this time that I believe the, uh, the shooter was in the back. Scott Ponder tried to make a phone call. He dialed 33 on his phone. He was dying. He was lying on the he was lying outside the door, outside the business, on the ground, bleeding to death. And he was trying to dial his wife's number. It was like, you know, one of those 
you know, you, know, you crowd, press three, three, and it goes through, right? And he pressed send. He dialed three, three, and he pressed send, attempting to reach his wife, I think, with a final goodbye, maybe one to identify the shooter. Ponder appears to have pushed himself up on his knees with his left arm and dialed his phone with his free right hand and pressed the send button at two minutes and 52 seconds. This was likely very uh, within minutes or seconds of when the shooter capped him in the head. I do not agree with the theory that Ponder dialed the phone number while run, running in a panic. I heard this one. Running in a panic over his friend and through the glass front door. I was told this. You know, really? You're trying to get away from a shooter and you're like, oh, let me make a phone call. Excuse me. Let me jump over my friend. Oh, let me make a phone call. You're trying to get the hell out of there and not get shot. You're not going to be making a phone call. But once you've been shot and you're on the ground and the shooter is no longer there, wouldn't you try, you know, to, uh, to make that phone call? I actually tried to recreate the scenario and I found it impossible to hit the three buttons on the phone while in this kind of motion. The shots in the head of the victims apparently ended their lives within seconds as there is no evidence of movement after the last shots were fired. So essentially he, Beverly guy was already down. The guy shot the, 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 the mechanic in the back of the head. Then he came out and he shot Brian Lucas and uh, Scott Ponder in the head, all brass casings in the head. Okay. That's what happened. Now, so now it gets it gets they say it gets it gets to be it's 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 quite a scenario. Um, so now we have these people are all they're all dead, and I will tell you the second part of what happened after the people were all killed and why I have how I thought about the suspects. But let me stop just for a second and tell you why it's not. Ted, Todd Colehead. Okay. Because that's what everybody's waiting for. Why is it not Todd Colehead? Oh, poor Karen. Okay. <laughs> Karen, all I, uh, you didn't. Okay. Uh, Karen, what I did was just describe that four people got shot in the motorcycle shop and how it went down. And I'm going to now explain why it's not to Todd Colehead. So you haven't quite missed this that Amber, this is correct. Nobody mixed ammo in the ma magazines. And one of the interesting things that was asked later was, well, could, would Todd Kolop have done that? And the answer is no. The guy was an ammo freak. The guy was an ammo freak. And he, by the way, hated brass ammo. So why would he mix up his ammo and use brass if he hated brass ammo? So there you go. So it's a bunch of bunch of stuff that just, you know, uh, really makes no sense. So, okay, let's let's find out what happened. And this, I'm going to show you. Oh, sorry. I got to keep. I just, I feel like my nose is going crazy. Really. They say, you know, if you itch your nose, you're lying, but that is not the case. I, I think it has something to do with chlorine in the pool. Uh, <laughs> okay. I am now going to show you after, after Todd Kolop got arrested, he confessed and this, this statement came out and it was, oops, that's not the statement. This statement came out. And it was the most, most bizarre statement. I, I was absolutely stunned. This came out on 48 hours. All right. Now, Melissa Ponder, she was the wife of, of uh, Scott Ponder, the owner. And they're on 48 hours. And Detective LaChica calls up. And this is on 48 hours, so we're talking it's on video. And this is the police telling this to the victim's family. So don't, if anybody's saying I'm making this crap up, no, I'm not, because this is proof. Um, so they called up Melissa Ponder on, the, on air, and she, they go, uh, we we got the guy, and she go she goes who is he? And Detective Lachica, who works for the Spartanburg Sheriff's Department, says Spartanburg County Sheriff's Department says his his name is Todd Colep. The detective told Melissa that Colep had admitted to firing a single bullet into the forehead of each of his victims, a fact that was never released to the public, and something only the killer would know. Okay. Doesn't that sound pretty, pretty, you know, wow, if you, that's true. Oh my God. If that's true, it must be, wow, it, it, it absolutely must be, it must be Todd Colop, right? This guy, Todd Colop, he confessed to doing this. I mean, you know, he shot a, a bullet into the forehead of each one of those victims and only he and the police knew this. That is a lie. Now, I understand that Todd Colop may have claimed that. He's a psychopath and a pathological liar. But the police said to the public and the families and to the media that the reason they knew Todd Colop was the killer was because he knew this one fact that he and only the police knew that each one of the victims was shot in the forehead. And let me tell you here today, 
Not one of the victims was shot in the forehead. Not one. Shot here, shot here, shot here, and shot here. But no one was shot in the forehead. And can I prove this? Damn straight I can. Because I have the autopsy report of exactly where the bullets were placed. Now, I went to the media. As soon as I heard this on 48 Hours, I went to the media and I said, look, this is a straight up lie. Nobody was shot in the forehead. This is a lie. And if the police are t saying this, they are lying. And this is malfeasance. And not one media outlet would give that information out. Not one media outlet. And that, 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 Evidence is record. It is a medical record. So it's not some, it's not my, oh, I looked at a picture. I thought she was shot here. And it, no, it's medical record done by the medical examiner that says exactly by inches where things are exactly the shots went in. Not one was shot in the forehead. Not even, and some people say, well, you know, one which he, we didn't, he didn't exactly mean like in the middle of the forehead. He could have meant over here. No, none of them were shot in the forehead period. And not only that, the way their bodies were, were laying, some of them couldn't have even been shot anywhere near the forehead. Because if, you're, if your, your head's like this, you can't shoot somebody in the forehead. So the fact that, uh, that Todd Kolob will be lying about that, okay. But why would the police repeat this? Or why would they tell the families this? And I believe that they thought this sounded so good that, hey, you know, not even I knew that they were shot in the forehead. You know why? Because it wasn't true. Um, in other words, there was no information out in the public that they were shot in the forehead. So this was some big, huge secret that only Todd Kolop knew. So therefore, he's guilty. Absolute rot, if I've ever heard absolute rot. And so offensive. I mean, that they would actually lie like that. Now, you wonder why they're lying like that. Now, there's a good question. Why would they lie like that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because after he was caught, he had a little chit chat with the, uh, the sheriff. And you know, I know he chit chatted with the sheriff. You know what? Okay, let me let me point out this little thing he said, which I thought was pretty funny, actually. Uh, let me put up the, uh, there's a guy here who, let, let, me, let me find this. Um, this guy here, uh, and I'm not gonna let him off the hook either because there's, whoops, there's no excuse for, for his, his, what he did either. Uh, this is, here he is. Tom Clark, retired Spartanburg Burke County investigator. He claims he spent, you know, all these hours, you know, having this, uh, this, he was doing all these, um, uh, there's a whole, the whole interrogation of Todd Cola here. Right. Uh, it's so, Hey, you know, he knows everything Todd Cola had to say. Now let's listen to what Todd Cola had to say at one point in this confession, which I thought was quite amusing. Actually, Todd Cola said, um, Oh, yeah, he said he didn't know any of the names of the victims, which I thought was interesting. You know, if you if you, you want to kill people that badly and you've been back, he's supposed to, now mind you, why did they say he was the guy who did it? I forgot to point this out. So after he after he was caught for the serial homicides and confessed to this uh, mass murder, it was it was found that he had been a customer in the shop and he had bought six months prior to this, this crime going down. He had bought a motorcycle there and had some, pro it was supposedly stolen and he went back to the shop, blah, blah, blah. And he he claimed that they made fun of him about his ability to ride the motorcycle and that they stole the motorcycle from him. Of course, it's just a bunch of lies from a psychopath and none of it made any sense. And then six months passes by and he decides to go kill everybody. Does that make any sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me. But, and he doesn't know the names of any of these people, but guess what? He knew my name, which I thought was pretty interesting. He actually said this. He discussed Ms. Brown with the detectives. He said she came to town and was running her mouth and her profile was completely wrong on all points. He didn't say my blog. He said my profile. Now, my profile was never made public. And the only person that had my profile was Sheriff, Sheriff Chuck Wright and the department. And the only person I knew he talked with that would talk about me was Chuck Wright. So was Chuck Wright discussing my profile with him? I find that quite interesting. And um, and so, oh, and, th and then it was quite uh, quite amusing because then the detective said, "Didn't isn't, isn't she dead?" And the other one said, "Yeah, I think she is." <laughs> Not 
dead. So, <laughs> so I find I find that really amusing. Um, uh, so anyway, the the things that came out of him led me to believe that before the taped interview, which we're having here, that Chuck Wright had a little discussion with him about Superbike, and that makes me concerned because, and you know, the the confession of um, of uh, Todd Kolop mirrors what the detectives the detect the, the department said happened and it mirrors it in a way that he can't even get it straight and i'm going to start telling you exactly what he got completely 100 percent wrong so you can see how bad it along with the fact he didn't shoot nobody was shot in the forehead which was the biggie that's absolute biggie here all right so here is what todd colip said all right he said he went in and sat around on a cycle until the place cleared of customers. Well, first of all, that's not true. He was not the last customer. The, the guy on that motorcycle that they're trying to pin him to the, remember the guy that, you know, the, the one that is in the composite, that's supposed to be the guy on the motorcycle, right? He was not the last person in the store. He was not. There was a last customer. It was not him. So he couldn't have waited till the place cleared. And don't you think it's kind of odd to sit around for like an hour letting everybody see your face so they can later identify you as the killer? Would you do that? That makes zero sense. And one of the reasons they had once, upon, you know, when they were saying that everybody was shot from the back so that maybe he could slip in the back and all that so nobody would see him. Well, you're sitting on the motorcycle for like an hour so that people can see your face and do a composite of you and then say, oh, yeah, you know, that's Todd Kolop. You know, Todd Kolop was a well-known realtor in the town. He ran his own real estate agency. You can tell me the guy who runs his own real estate agency is going to sit on a motorcycle and let everybody see his face for a long time until he waits for everybody's out of there and then he's going to kill everybody? Do you really think that makes a lot of sense? Okay, no, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So now also he says, he, he get this one, Colop says he didn't want to kill paying customers either. <laughs> this is a guy who kidnaps women and men and rapes and murders them and buries them in his backyard. But he's worried about killing innocent people. Oh, isn't that tweet? Yeah. Okay, let's not believe that one. Okay, so that that was him on the motorcycle. It was probably not him on the motorcycle. That's probably nonsense that he was told, oh yeah, we think it was the guy that was on the motorcycle. It must have been you. He goes, okay, that'll that'll be me. So he was definitely. And I say the guy on the motorcycle was never the last customer in, in there anyway. Oh, also, the guy who, the witness, I'm not going to give the guy's name, but the witness to the guy on the motorcycle who gave us the composite too, said he never identified that man as Cola, by the way. So even though he gave the composite and everything, he never said that was the guy. Um, he also stated that he seemed to be a first-time buyer and that Scott Ponder did not know him. Now, remember, this is the guy that supposedly bought bought the motorcycle from the place then they took him riding on it and then they made fun of him and then they supposedly stole his bike and then he went back to the place they would know who this guy is and and not there's just no way he's going to walk in there and they have no clue never seen him before so that, that doesn't make any sense either so anyway we have this guy supposedly call-ups in there hanging around the shop for almost an hour before the shootings which is ridiculous all right so that that's the first thing that makes no sense all right so now he, Colip says he waited uh, for the place to clear of customers and for Brian Lucas to return to the property. Now, mind you, this, this is all public. A lot of this is public knowledge. And also the sheriff can certainly possibly pass this information on. He says when all four people are finally in the store, those are the people he supposedly killed. And it seemed like there was no one else there. What? That's not possible because when Brian Lucas did return, he came to put a baffle on another guy's bike the true last customer's bike. And that last customer we know is there because he was his, uh, uh, his credit card was swiped and then he left. We know he was there. I'm not gonna give his name either, but we know he was there. As a matter of fact, he was, he was a suspect in this crime because he was the last customer. And you know, if you're the last customer in the store and you're pissed off and he was a little bit, he was a little angry. He was, he was angry at the time. And that's why he was a suspect that he could have, you know, then come then since he knows everybody's in the store and he's the only one there he could have shot everybody uh, and he he did have weapons he refused to take a polygraph so i will tell you why it's not likely him but he was a good suspect and he was he was looked at so 
this is bold that Cole would have been the last person in the store. It, was, it would not have been him. He would have had to come back. So in other words, the last customer would have had to left and then Cole would have had to come back. So that's a complete lie. Let's look at the next thing. He also says, uh, he, he, he also goes with the police statement that he, he shot the mechanic in the back first and then he shot Beverly Guy and then he shot the two men as they ran out the door. Not true. Sherbert was the last victim of the superbike killer. The magazine with the brass shells was the second magazine used. The reason just seven shells were used out of the brass magazine was because at that point, all the victims were dead. Now, if you, if the brass, now Colop says he used the brass one first. Now, if you use the brass one first, she would have run, he would have run out of 11 bullets. Well, there weren't, there were only seven brass, brass casings there. So he only used seven bullets. Are you going to tell me that while he was shooting, and he says this actually, in the midst of the two men trying to run out the front door, he actually does, the, he actually changes the magazine at that point while they're running out the door, even though he's got bullets left in the gun, he's got, he's only got used seven. He didn't use the rest of them. Why didn't he use the other three? You know, if he had that left there, it makes no sense. And the, so the only reason there were only seven brass bullets used is because that everybody was dead. It was a second magazine used and there was no reason to shoot anymore. The first magazine was 11. There were 11 shots fired with the nickel. Then he ran out, changed the magazine, shot seven more, and then everybody was dead. That's that's the way we're. Colip has it backwards. He says he used a, he used a silver first. No, he says he used a nickel first. I'm sorry, he used the brass first, and then he used the nickel. Not true. That is not the way it worked. Anyway, Sherbet was also shot twice from the area of the swinging doors because there are two bullets in the wall. And it would seem the first one nicked him as he threw a wrench that had blood on it in the direction of the shooter. The shooter then came up over him and shot him in the back once in the chest and then came around the end of the bike and shot him once in the top of the head. Not the forehead, top of the head. All of these five shots were in brass. Kolop says that when he came through the swinging doors and all the other three were right there, um, wait a minute, he says he shot Beverly Guy two or three times in the chest and he said those were brass, those were not. Uh, so Beverly guy was only shot once in the chest and it was nickel casing. She was also shot once in the head, nickel casing. So no brass shot there. Um, next call up. Okay. So, so basically colp has got this completely backwards. He says he shot guy first and, and then, you know, he shot the guy in the back first with the wrong case with the wrong ammunition. And then he came forward. He shot, he basically has got the entire thing completely wrong. Next, Colip says that the two got, men were running toward the door and he hit one of them, Brian Lucas, two or three times in the back with the brass. No, he didn't. Causing him to collapse in the doorway and the other leaped over him. False. Both men sustained all body shot, shots with uh, nickel casings. Brian Lucas only sustained one body shot. Complete lies. At this point, Colip said he made a tactical reload. Even though he's got guys escaping and still should have another three shots in the magazine, and one extra in the chamber, he decides to lose time and change magazines. This would mean he would then load his 10 round nickel magazine with no time to chamber any round and add an extra to the magazine. So how does he end up shooting 11 shots if it's a second magazine and the gun only nickel shots? See, it gets very convoluted. It's, it can't happen. And it's going to be very hard to understand this by me reading it to you, uh, which is why I suggest you go to my website and actually read it and think about it. But I'm just trying to get you the idea that um, Colip has the magazines backwards. And there's no way it could have happened the way Kolop says it could have happened. Then Kolop says, uh, okay. So then he supposedly has, let's say, da, 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 da. Uh, there are brass shell casings outside the store by Scott Ponder's body, which there shouldn't, there shouldn't be according to him. Uh -huh. Okay, let me go on for it. Okay, Kolop follows the men to the door and shoots Scott Ponder multiple times. This would be with a nickel shot, which is accurate. Then he says he shot Ponder in the forehead. And then went back and shot each victim in the forehead, which would still be with nickel ammo. None of this makes any sense. Uh, Ponder, Lucas, and Sherbert were all shot in the head with brass ammo, not nickel. Okay? None of the victims were shot in the forehead. None. So, Lucas was shot on the left side of the head. Ponder was shot on the right side of the head. Guy was shot on the right side of the head. And Sherbert was shot on the top of the head. So, it basically, he's just got every single one of these things wrong, and it's very hard for me to explain it to you here. But I say, go to my web, go go to the blog. You can read it, and it, it takes a lot of thinking to figure it out. Very hard to figure it out because you're going, what? What did he shoot? When did he shoot? And even I get confused when I'm trying to reread it. But it's 
it's from the crime scene. I have the picture of all where, where all the, the casings were and was able to figure out exactly what casings, well, who was shot with what casings. Okay, so basically here, here's what he's wrong about. Check this out. Todd Kolop was wrong about which magazine was used first. Todd Kolop was wrong about how many shots were fired at Chris Sherbert and how the shots were fired into his body. Todd Kolop was wrong about how many shots were fired into Beverly Guy. Todd Kolop was wrong that Brian Lucas was hit by any brass shots. Todd Kolop was wrong that the killer changed magazines in the process of changing the two men out the door. Todd Kolop was wrong that Brian Lucas, Scott Ponder, and Chris Sherbert were kept in the head with silver ammo. Todd Kolop was wrong that any of the victims were shot in the forehead. Boy, that's a hell of a lot of wrong things in a confession. And you got to wonder, how is it that they his, all this interrogation went on and every single thing he said was wrong? And yet, he's the guy. No, no suspicion that this guy's lying like a dog. Actually, there was a point where they actually asked him if he did. And he goes, well, you say, you say so. <laughs> you know, in other words, if he got all this wrong, Scott, Todd Kolop was not there. That's why he got it wrong. Totally not there. Now, let me point out a couple other things. Is that all? I mean, he's got, okay, nobody was shot in the forehead. All the, he, the magazines are switched backwards. He's got them wrong. He's got the order of the shooting wrong. And he's got how many shots he shot into everybody wrong. All of that's wrong as well. Now, interesting enough, oh, I gotta get to that in a minute. Uh, he also said this, got this one. He claims he left his college, Greenville Technical College, on the day of the murder around 2 p.m. or maybe 1.30. And, he's, and he, drive, he has to drive there. Do you know that he couldn't even arrive at time, at, on time to commit the crime? He could not arrive there on time to commit the crime. Absolutely impossible. Um, and that is also listed here. You can read the exact minutes on that. So he couldn't even have made it there to commit the crime. Um, so absolutely impossible. Now, now I'm going to get to who, who done it. But I want to point out this first, because this, this is one of the more astounding things about, about the media and, their, and, and what, the, what the, the kind of stuff they do. Okay, this, this is, this is a, a movie that came out about it. And this is called Serial Killer, Devil Unchained. Woo. And um, okay, and the two people involved in this piece of garbage um, are this woman over here, this woman, uh, Maria Always. Uh, always, always, okay, always, I always forget how to pronounce her name. She's a, a journalist from Minneapolis doing this for the Discovery Channel, a channel I have worked for, by the way, and has now questioned, I question their ethics now to have this kind of nonsense going on. Uh, this, this character over here, his name is Gary Garrett. He used to work for Todd Fulop in the real estate agency, and he decided to become buddies with him in prison and, you know, write to him and then, then become his biographer. By the way, he never did actually write the book, thank God, because that would have been garbage. But interestingly enough, this is what stunned me. So anyway, they do this show, okay? So she's pretending to be this super investigative journalist. And and so they, they, talk, they do talk about all the things Todd Kolop did with, you know, the serial homicides. And then they get to the mass murder at Superbike. And they talk about how he definitely did it. And then, lo and behold, this piece of crap, um, Gary Garrett, claims that when he was talking to uh, Todd Kolop, he had some questions that maybe, maybe he didn't do it. He started talking to him thinking maybe he was lying. Maybe he didn't do it. So Mar Maria over here, she decides she's going to study the crime scene stuff. And she comes up with the fact that, you know, maybe he had the order of the shooting wrong. And maybe none of the, none of, no, none of the people were shot in the forehead like Tolep claimed. So she's like, oh my God, I discovered, I discovered these two things. He was not shot. None of, nobody was shot in the forehead and the order of the shooting was wrong. You know whose name wasn't mentioned in all of this? Oh, yeah, mine. They, she claimed she came up with this independently. So did Garrett. Both of these guys came up with this independently. Apparently, they claim they never heard of, they never heard about me working on the case. They never heard of anything I ever said. Now, check this out. This was, when was his, when did this thing come out? Um, I'm trying to figure out when, I, I forgot when the actual show came out. But look at this. 2012, I wrote about the motorsports. Here's another one, 2012. This is when I wrote about all the different things that happened. 2012, 2012. Over here, is Todd Kolop really the super, uh, super bike killer? That was 16. None of the super bike victims are, uh, were, got shot in the forehead. That's a 16. Uh, that's super bike composite, 
Is it Todd Collip? No. False confession of Todd Collip. More on the false confession of Todd Collip, 2016, 2017. This all, this all, all of this came out before their film came out, way before their film came out. And not only that, not only that, John Douglas, who they talked to in the film, also knew I worked on the case. The sheriff knew I worked on the case. I had, there was actually newspaper articles where I said that they were lying. That was there too. And my blogs were actually linked to some of them. So these two, these two unethical human beings have the gall to say they knew nothing about anything I ever wrote about, yet they came up with the same conclusions I did. Oh, is that possible? Then it gets really, I mean, it just gets unbelievable. Then, <laughs> wait till you hear this though. So then they go to, you know, they go to, um, uh, John Douglas, and they ask him about this. How is it possible, right, that he would have mixed up the ammo, that he would have ordered the shooting wrong, that he didn't know he didn't shoot them in the forehead? Get this explanation. Wait till you hear this explanation from John Douglas. Nor does it explain that while Todd told investigators he shot each victim in the forehead before leaving the scene, the autopsy reports show none of the victims have bullet wounds to the front of the head. When I ask retired FBI agent John Douglas about these discrepancies in Todd's accounts with the bullets and the location of the bodies, this is what he tells me. And I don't expect him to remember every specific element of the case. It's not a type of case like other serial killers who I've interviewed where it's a fantasy and they fantasize about what they want to do to the victim. This is revenge. This is retaliation. What the Wow. I mean, let's look at this. I mean, just think about this. The guy lied about the, bull, the shooting everybody in the forehead. He lied about everything. And, and any profiler worth their salt, any investigator worth their salt would say that's because the guy wasn't there because he's lying about this. And all of a sudden, because it doesn't support Cola being the killer, John Douglas goes, oh, wait, I guess he just forgot. <laughs> now, now, <laughs> forgot this. Todd Cola has a mind like a steel trap. He remembers everything. He is a, he's one of those kind of guys that likes details, loves details. He's not a sloppy dude, he loves details. And yet he forgets everything about this crime. Every single thing about this crime he's got wrong. And John Douglas explains this away by saying, oh, I guess he forgot. No, how about you just supporting the lies that come out of the the Spartanburg County Sheriff's Department and the media. Maybe you're part of the problem. And maybe these two are part of the problem too. Now, interesting enough, after they stole my stuff <laughs> and claimed they came up with these ideas themselves, now they say, oh, see, didn't matter anyway. Didn't matter anyway. Okay. <sighs> now, okay, so, you know, I try, I try to control myself. Yes. Oh, yes, kiss my ex. And I would, uh, it must be infuriating to see others taking credit for your work. So dishonest, so dishonest of them. Yeah, it is. I mean, I mean, I worked. I mean, it's not like I didn't work on the case too. It's not like I was just somebody out there who put some, you know, made some commentary out in the, in the middle of nowhere. And nobody ever saw it. No, I worked with the sheriff's department on this case. They have the, they have the profile. So you can't tell me you're an investigative reporter and had no clue, especially since she knows who I am. Cause I lived in Minnesota for four years. And I do believe I might've even done some stuff with her. You know, don't tell me that garbage and don't tell me this piece of crap um, <laughs> who, who happened to be a real, help him do some real estate stuff suddenly comes up with all this ideas himself. You No, know, uh, I'm not gonna buy it for a minute. I mean, none of the detectives even came up with this. You know, this is stuff I came up from analyzing all the details of the case. So now the question comes down to who the hell did this if it wasn't Todd Kolop? And I'm gonna say again, not one shred of evidence supports that Todd Kolop did anything. They convicted him based on a false confession. The confession was 100% completely wrong. And they convicted him based on that and gave him a plea deal. So he got out of the death penalty. And to me, that's egregious. Oh, and by the way, uh, another gentleman uh, who retired, uh, he, he, uh, he did some work with me. 
He was he is a um, retired police officer and board certified investigator. Uh, his name was Don Corbett. He also did some work on this case with me. And then we tried to fight this whole thing that was going on. And we went for a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request, to try to get some of the information that they've been hiding about ballistics and so on and so forth. It cost $900. And I had him do the request so they keep my name away from it. But I gave him the 900 bucks to get it done. You know what we got back? We got back some crime scene photos without bodies. And we got a copy of, uh, oh, yeah, that uh, Todd Cola bought a motorcycle for $900. Now, mind you, we gave them a sheet and we listed everything we wanted. We asked, we said, we want this for your request to cover. And we said all the things we wanted it to cover. I had a whole detailed list of all the forensics, ballistics and all that. They agreed to it. We sent the $900 in and they reneged on it and didn't give it to us. We tried to go to the, we tried to get, go to the judges about this and file complaints. Nothing came of it. I lost $900. So See, more fun stuff. Okay, so now, <laughs> tell you, this is a very complicated mess. Uh, and I'm just trying to get you to sort of understand the nightmare of it all. Okay, so let's go to the case itself. Now I'm gonna, let me let me do the, uh, let me first play you this, um, play you this. This is what happened the day the, this, this, oh, this guy here, let me show you his picture first. This is the guy that called the 911 call and after the people were all dead on the floor, then a guy made a 911 call from the business. And this is, where'd he go? Oh, there he is. Okay, this is the guy that made the 911 call. This guy's name is Noel Lee. Uh, I love the fact that he wore, he's been on, the reason I'm giving his name is because he did this show. This was the one I was just talking about. And he also did a bunch, I think he did Geraldo as well. Um, so in other words, he's already put himself into the media eye I did not mention the other two names on, on here because they did not put themselves into the media's eye. He did so, and he and they told they said his name, Noel Lee. So I'm gonna say it. It's Noel Lee, because they already talked about him. I just think it's weird he wears sunglasses for this interview. But anyway, let's hear about Noel Lee when he makes the phone call to the business. Here he comes. Okay, what's the problem? Apparently, everybody's been shot up here. In the building? Yeah. I thought they were playing a prank on me, but hell, everybody's laying down in a pool of blood. While he's talking to the 911 dispatcher, Noel sees Scott's mom, Beverly Guy. I saw Scott's mom laying in the floor. It looked like she had come out of the bathroom, which is right beside the double doors, going into the, the work area. And uh, that's when it, it, it things just started hitting me. His mama been shot, the mechanic been shot, and the owner. How many subjects? Right now, I only see three. I'm scared to walk in the back of three people down here. Okay, now I'm going to come back to a comment he made when he said who was shot, um, because that's very interesting. Who he said was shot. Uh, so I will replay this later and I will point that out to you. But anyway, he, there's a lot of people don't know about what happened when Noel Lee made the phone call. Now, uh, let's take a look. Uh, before I go into Noel Lee, I want to talk about the last customer. Since theoretically, the last customer was the last customer. And he could have had the opportunity to commit the crime because nobody else was there but the last customer. And he... Um, so what happened was he the, the, when when Scott Ponder made the tried to attempt to make the phone call, it came in at a specific time, and we know what time that was because um, it's on the it, it's registered. You know, this is the time that he made the phone, and then it stopped. He was shot in the head. Now, from the time he made that phone call to the time the truck of the last customer passed by a convenience store down the way. There was a specific amount of time that uh, that that passed by. Okay, now the question would be if the last customer had shot Scott Ponder. Well, that's when we know for for a fact he was still there. Was when Scott Ponder got shot. Could he have enough time to get in his vehicle, his truck, and it was a truck. I think he was also towing like a motorcycle, and go down the country road 
and pass by the convenience store by a specific point in time when he showed up on the camera. Was there enough time to get from point A to point B? I asked the, uh, the I asked the sheriff's department if anybody ever tested that, and nobody ever had tested that. So I decided I had to test this. Um, so what I did, I had I actually had rented a sports car, so I had a sports car. So what I did was I sat in the parking lot at, at right where the going onto the road, and I would wait till all the cars pass by, and then I'd sit there with the most empty road I could get. And then when I saw a car approaching, finally I would pull out in front, and then I hit the gas and went as fast as I could down that country road, as fast as I could without killing myself. And mind you, I did break the speed limit, so I did mention it to the sheriff at the time. I was like, "Don't don't send me ten tickets," because <laughs> you know? I did break the speed limit, and I raced as fast as I could possibly do it to get to that store. And I could never make it in that time frame, Never. And I did it over and over and over. And mind you, I was driving a sports car. This guy's driving a truck, pulling stuff behind it. There's no way on God's earth. The last customer could have made it from the time Scott Ponder was shot in the head and he couldn't make any more of that phone call to the time he arrived passing by that store, the video camera. Now, the next question I asked them is a very reasonable question. Did you check the video camera timing to make sure that the time was accurate on the video camera? Because if the time was not accurate on the video camera, then maybe the last customer could have killed them. But guess what? Nobody had an answer for that. Nobody ever checked the time on the camera. So if the camera was accurate, the last customer couldn't have done it. If the timing was off on the camera, maybe he could have. Now, so he, I kept him as my number two suspect. And the reason I kept as number two suspect is because I don't know the answer to the question on whether the time, the time was off or not on the camera. So he's number two suspect because he could have done it if, if the camera was off. All right. So now we go to number one suspect. And why does somebody become a number one suspect? And let me say straight up front, because Noelia has uh, sent, sent me some nice, interesting messages on Facebook, uh, which weren't too friendly, about the fact that I have said, you know, in my opinion, they should have looked at him a little harder. Uh, and there's good reasons to look at him a little harder. So it's not like there's no, there's, <laughs> there's no reason. Let me tell you some of the reasons. All right, first of all, the person who discovers bodies at a crime scene and they say finds the bodies at a crime scene often does so because he is the guy that committed the crime he might be worried his fingerprints are there there's blood on him or whatever and so he can, if he can arrive touch bodies and do you know mess up the crime scene he can say well you know i found the bodies and that's why my dna is here okay however noel noel lee did not have blood on his person or his clothing nor did he touch the bodies okay he only touched the phone in the business okay now <laughs> i got to show you this so this, this, this is just, this is, this is where you start questioning somebody. All right. So he made this phone call. Now, if you notice the phone call he made, uh, okay, wait a minute. Where's the picture? Where's the, I swear to God, something has vanished from my, wow. That's actually, you know, I've had trouble before with, uh, uh, certain things, um, disappearing off of my thing and it, and it's happened again. So I can't show you that particular picture, but Okay, there's a phone inside the business. Okay, and I want to I want to ask you something about this, so you can add your commentary here. Okay, so all right. First of all, he told two stories. He changed his story between the stories. He said, "Oh, I may have not said. I may have told you things wrong the first time. I my, because I couldn't remember things correctly because I take medication and stuff." He actually said this. The first time he told the story, he just drove there. Oh, and he said this. I made a phone call to the business. And I asked about these tickets to this, this, this show I wanted to go to. And I talked to Beverly Guy. Now, mind, oh, beside, mind you, he was best friends, supposedly with the owner and the, and the co-owner, right? The, the business, uh, the manager, the, the owner and the business manager, Scott Ponder and Brian Lucas were his friends. However, they just, I'd heard they'd had a falling out and he hadn't been allowed to come around for the last couple of weeks. So there was an issue between them, a personal issue. So anyway, for some reason, right before this happens, he calls the business and he's Beverly guy tells him that there's two tickets for this event that are there. That's what he says. So he jumps in the car and drives down. OK, the second time he tells a story, he says, for some reason, I decided to take a shower, <laughs> which 
you know, whenever you hear the word for some reason, that usually means you're lying uh, about something, but you're about to say, no, if you were just going to run down and grab some tickets, why the hell would you take a shower to do that? Except for if you take a shower, you couldn't possibly get there in time to commit a murder. In other words, your time is accounted for and you couldn't have made it there before that you made the phone call. In other words, so you couldn't have been there, committed the murder, disappeared for a few minutes, got rid of stuff and come back and made the phone call. You wouldn't have had time if you happened to take that shower. You know, for, for some reason you took a shower. So anyway, the second time around, he says he took a shower. Then he goes to the business. Now, the, f <laughs> the first time he just says he goes to the business uh, and he makes a phone call. Then the second time he says that um, he's on the phone. He's on a cell phone, mind you. He's on the cell phone with his girlfriend and he's talking with her and he arrives at the business and he sees them die, his friends lying on the ground. Why he thinks they would be playing a prank on him. But in the middle of the day, do you really honestly think that your friends are going to put blood on themselves and lie in a doorway and that's a prank they're going to play in the middle of a business day? I thought that was weird right there, but okay. So he claims that uh, he's making the phone, he's talking to his girlfriend. She says, oh my God, this is what happened. They're, they're, they're dead over there. They look like they're, they're lying there dead with blood on them and everything. She tells him, this is his claim. She tells him, uh, he says, I'm, go I'm going to cross, cross the street to make a phone call from an uh, another house that's nearby. So it was what was a relative, uh, I think of somebody's. And she goes, oh, don't do that. It looked like you're running away from the scene, like you're guilty. Go inside and make the phone call. So let me get this straight. You don't go to safety on the other side of the road and take to somebody's house and make a phone call. You don't call from your cell phone, which is in your hand. No, you decide to go into the building where the killer might still be. You step over the bleeding bo dead bodies of your friends to go into a building to call from a wall phone when you don't know who, if the killers are still, a killer could still be in there. Does this make sense to you? Or does that mean that you don't have any fear for your own safety when you walk in that place and make that phone call? That's what I would say. Now, now here's another interesting thing. What did he go there for? Oh, yes, a couple tickets. I asked the police department, the sheriff's, sheriff's department, I said, where are the tickets? Guess what? I never got an answer. The tickets were not in evidence. Now, the ticket should have been in one of two places. Either when you see your dead friends on the ground, you, and there, you, let's say there's some tickets lying on a table there in the office, you see your dead friends there? Do you actually go in and take the tickets off the table and put them in your pocket? Because they didn't, by the way, they didn't find any tickets on them, supposedly. And there were no tickets in the business. So either the tickets were never there and you lied about the tickets. You lied about the reason you were going there because the only person that could say whether you're telling the truth is dead. Maybe he didn't go there to pick up tickets. Maybe he went there because he was pissed off. Maybe there was a guy, the last customer said, that he heard Beverly Guy talking sharply to somebody from the office. And he, she only, he only heard one voice, just Beverly Guy's voice talking sharply. So he figured she was on the phone, angry at somebody. And that was about the time that uh, uh, Noli called, um, supposedly called and talked to her. What did she tell him? I don't know. Did she really tell him there were tickets there? Because there were no tickets there in evidence. Uh, and there were no tickets supposedly on his body either. So where were those tickets that he supposedly was picking up? Do they even exist? So that was a really fascinating thing. Uh, so we have changing stories. We have the fact that guy would, instead of calling on a cell phone or crossing the street, would walk into a crime scene where it, the killer might still be. His description, oh, they're all just lying down here. In the is almost like too weirdly happy, which is just strange. I mean, that the way he just described it just was, was weird. And here was an interesting point. Now, I want you to listen to this at the very end. I'm going to play it one more time so you can just listen to his voice and listen to what he says about who are the three people. Who are the three people that um, were, were, he said, were. Spotlight down one morning. Where's your emergency? It's at uh, Cooler Ride Motorsports on Ferry Creek Road. Okay, what's the problem? Apparently, everybody's been shot up here. In the building? Yeah. I thought they were playing a prank on me, but hell, everybody's laying down. While he's talking to the 911 dispatcher, Noel sees Scott's mom, Beverly Guy. I saw Scott's mom laying in the floor. It looked like she had come out of the bathroom, which is right beside the double doors. 
going into the, the work area. And uh, that's when it, it things just started hitting me. His mama been shot, the mechanic been shot, and the owner. How many subjects? Right now, I only see three, and I'm scared to walk in the back of three people down here. Okay. He said the owner's been shot, his mama's been shot, and the mechanic's been shot. Hello. That's not true. In the front room, it was the owner, his mama, and his friend, Brian Lucas, who had been shot. Those were the front. The mechanic was in the back. That was a place he said he was afraid to go back into because he didn't, you know, and they told him, don't do it. He said the mechanic's been shot. Now, Freudian slip or just, uh, you know, he was so panicked at the time. He And he happened to know there was a mechanic in the shop and he's just said the wrong thing. Or did he know the mechanic had been shot? Did he? Why did he even know the mechanic was even there? It was a good question, too. Why did he know that? Could the mechanic could have been out to lunch. The panic mechanic could have not. Maybe the mechanic wasn't there that day. Why would he even know the mechanic was there if the mechanic wasn't back the whole time? When he walked in, he had no idea if the mechanic was there. Yet he says the mechanic has been shot. Now, I just find it interesting. Now, let's take a look. When, when you take a look at the situation of who's here. So, oh, he, no, he did do that. He, he said he, she came out of the bathroom. Well, her location, I'll give him credit on that one. Her location was such that she could have, in that location, come out of, of, of that, lo that, that spot. It could have, but <laughs> we, we don't actually know that, but, you know, he could have just had a good lucky guess. That's possible. Um, but here you have, you have, let's like, let's like a look. If you had two suspects, you have a guy who finds the bodies, changes his story, goes into a place where the, where the killer could still be instead of using his cell phone or, or going someplace else to make the phone call. So, and he says a whole bunch of squirrely things. He says that, um, he claims in the second interview that he's on medication to keep him from wigging out. And he's had seizures since the stress of his first marriage and short-term memory problems, which cause him to forget things. Okay, sure. Uh, and then the tickets. The tickets are never found that he claims that he claims he came and went to get. Never found. Uh, next day, by the way, he does go to the event with his son. He, he just goes to an event. His friends have brutally just been murdered, but he goes out the next day and has a good time. Okay, you have this, this character. Or you have Todd Kolep, who knows nothing about the scene whatsoever, claims that they were shot, everybody was shot in the forehead, which they weren't, uh, has the whole scene backwards, has the magazines backwards, everything's wrong about what he says. There's absolutely no proof that he was in there that day. Yet Todd Kolep is convicted of a crime which he has no knowledge of. And Brian Lucas, I'm sorry, and uh, Noah Lee, was improperly investigated from the beginning. Now, do, am I saying Noel Lee is guilty? No, I'm not. I'm simply saying, since he's also put himself out here yet again in the public eye, that he said a lot of things that happened around him were questionable. Um, and he should have been looked at more appropriately, either to exclude him as a suspect, to prove that he didn't do it, or to find out that he indeed did, did, and did indeed did do it. Um, and for, you know, and the fact that the sheriff's department didn't want to comment on the missing tickets in evidence and the other weird issues around him. I, I asked them, uh, did, did you talk to the girlfriend? He claimed he was on a cell phone with his girlfriend. He would have proof of that. And they never answered that question. Was he ever really even on the cell phone with his girlfriend on the way there? Did, did his girlfriend ever really tell him to walk into the middle of a murder scene? Or that was that his own decision? And I never got an answer from the sheriff's department, even though I was working with them and was sitting in the department at the time asking those specific questions. Where are the tickets? Did you talk to the girlfriend? And I never got an answer on that. So this is the kind of stuff. This is the truth about the super bright case that has never made it into the public eye uh, because 48 hours didn't care. Geraldo didn't care. And, and Maria always didn't care. Neither did Discovery when they put out all of this stuff that was nonsense and unethical. And basically the whole point was to support that Todd Kolip was the guilty party. Todd Kolip did it. Todd Kolip did it. That was 
what everybody wanted to say that that that's that's what happened. They didn't care about the truth. They only cared about getting the story that they wanted to get, uh, which was really cool story, isn't it? The guy's a serial killer and a mass murderer. Woohoo! And did they ask him about the tickets? Well, there you go. This is the whole point, Amber. I asked them that question and they would not answer me and they wouldn't answer why the tickets were not in evidence. Where were they? Where were the tickets that supposedly were there? And uh, yes, Claire, I don't think he should have known about the mechanic. Now, mind you, he might have known that a mechanic worked there and that they, maybe he knew that they'd hired somebody. But would he know that the, the mechanic was in the back? I mean, did he... I mean, at that point in time when he supposedly pulled in, did he know the? I don't even know if the mechanic had a vehicle there. That's a good. I, can't, I actually can't remember that. Uh, would he? And if, if there was no vehicle for the mechanic, there would be no evidence he was there. The mechanic could have parked him back. The, they wouldn't have seen that. And if there was another car there, how would he know it was a mechanic? I mean, he wouldn't know the mechanics there. That's that's an ab absolute point. Um, they just don't know. Um, he shouldn't have known, and he shouldn't have said that. Um, but he did. And one of the reasons he could have known is because he was there. And the one of the reasons Todd Kolop knows nothing is because Todd Kolop was clearly not there. And, you know, the simple fact that I have not been able to get anybody ever to look at the truth of this case. And it's funny because this Discovery Channel one with the quote investigative journalist actually does bring my information out there. She actually does say in the show that nobody was shot in the forehead. But you know, what's fascinating to me and that, and that the order of the killing was wrong. She actually says this in the show. Doesn't give me credit for it, but she says it. But yet when she said it and John Douglas said, ah, you know, nobody goes back to look at the simple fact that the detective, La Chica from the Spartanburg County Sheriff's Department told the families that he knew Todd Kolb knew something only the killer and the police knew, which was all the victims were shot in the forehead. So even if you say Todd Kolb was confused and didn't remember anything, how do you explain away the fact that the police lied to the family, lied to the public, lied to the media, and lied to prove that this guy, Todd Kolb, was indeed the superbike killer when he there was no evidence at all supporting that fact? This is... This is one of the most frustrating things I've ever dealt with in my life. Um, and, you know, I say I, I give a lot of room for, you know, mistakes, errors, because as I say, nobody's perfect. Um, I'm not perfect either. And somebody could come down one day and say, you know, Pat, you should have screwed that up. I'll go. So I did. But I don't lie. And I'm, I'm going out to the public and lying like this. If you, if, if a police, you know, it's one thing to lie to the suspect. You know, you got him in there, you're interrogating him and you don't tell him the truth. That's one thing. Uh, but after the guy's been actually caught, there's absolutely zero reason to lie about something like that, except to convince everyone that you've got the right guy. And, um, that is, that is extremely egregious and, uh, and something that should never happen. And the fact that the media doesn't give a damn that this happened, that the wrong guy has probably been convicted in this crime, that the actual killer may still be out there in the community that justice has never happened in this case never happened that's the frustrating part and that the media is complicit along with everybody else who's been complicit in this and and, and, and promoting a lie now you know i'm okay if todd if todd cole had for whatever reasons was the weirdest serial killer slash mass murder that ever existed i'm okay with that if he had known things that he should have known or, or shouldn't have known, if he really did, if he had gotten anything right, if they had found any evidence in his house, if there had been any sense in, in him committing the crime, if it had happened one day after he claimed that they stole his stuff, maybe I'd go for it. But the motive is ridiculous. There's no physical evidence. And everything he said about the crime scene is completely 100% wrong. And yet... They were perfectly willing to accept his confession. Confession. How can you confess to something you know nothing about? And how is it any kind of good police department would allow a confession to stand? How would a prosecutor allow a confession to stand when they know it has absolutely zero merit? And, and that that's, you know, 
Uh, that's my my end statement about that. Uh, Amber, after this, I agree. Colop didn't do it. As I said in the beginning, Amber, uh, I, you know, there's so much information here. I, I I know I'm stumbling over some of it here because it's just so hard to present all of it in 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 a, in a situation like, in, a, in a show like this uh, without actually literally putting all the information up on a screen. And this is a live show, so that I'm not doing. But again, go go below. You can click on it. I've got every one of the uh, every one of the blogs there. You can read them all. Uh, I know there's a couple errors in one of the blogs um, uh, about the um, number of uh, shots. And, you know, it's, it's, I haven't even, to tell you the truth, I haven't looked at this in years because I sort of gave up after after this whole nightmare. Uh, and, and I saw this show come out and I was, you know, uh, my work was uh, stolen and then Colop was just convicted and nobody seemed to give a darn that he, that, that the evidence never supported it. You know, you sometimes you have to put things to rest. Um, and, you know, people say, how do you live with stuff like this? Knowing stuff that is wrong and you can't do anything about it. And, and you know, that's life. I mean, it's unfortunate, um, dreadfully unfortunate, uh, you know, that you can't prove some, you know, you can prove things, but because you don't have the, you don't have the p power, a lot of times political power to, to get that information out. Um, maybe nobody ever even sees it. Uh, maybe the right people don't see it. Maybe some people see it. I'm sure that uh, Maria all, always, I can't never pronounce her name again, always, uh, she saw it. I'm, I absolutely believe, if she said, she independently came up with this, I don't, that's nonsense and I don't believe it. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and I don't believe this Gary fellow, you know, she, the so-called so biographer came up with it either. Clearly, since all of my evidence was out there, uh, out there for her to see, if she was investigating anything, she would have come across it. So either call yourself a not an investigative journalist or, or, or tell the truth that you, you, you accessed all of my, all of the blogs and all the information I put out there in the media and you got the information, used it in your show and uh, didn't give me, didn't give me credit for it. But what's even worse is the simple fact that yes, <laughs> the information came out again, that nobody was shot in the forehead, but nobody cares that the police lied about it. Just, uh, just so frustrating. Um, <laughs> yeah. Claire Morgan says, yeah, it doesn't add up. No, it doesn't add up. I mean, you know, it just doesn't add up. I mean, there's, there's just nothing there. And, and you know, it, it's so frustrating. Uh, you're most welcome, Simone. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming here and listening. I say, I haven't dealt with this case in years because, you know, I've got, I say I've got a number of cases, which I know people have been, uh, incorrectly convicted. Um, uh, there's place, there's cases where I absolutely think the person convicted was convicted rightly. Uh, I've, I've spoken up for those, which I think, you know, the right guy, what right people are in there or the right guys in there, but there's these cases, which I know, uh, aren't so, and this is the most egregious of them all because it was so outrageously not true. Um, and, uh, just, mm, you know, it, to totally, totally frustrating. Oh Yeah. This is true. Those cameras are notorious for the timing being out. Exactly, Amber. I mean, you know, the first question I asked him was, okay, I can't make it in that time frame. And I, I mean, it would have taken him at least five to six minutes longer uh, to get there. It, in other words, the machine would have had been at least five minutes off. Um, and it could have been. But how is it you didn't check that? How is it you don't know whether the guy could get from point A to point B? If he's, if he's the last guy in the shop, wouldn't you want to know that? I, I, I was stunned that nobody checked that out. Um, and he was the most outside of Noel Lee was the second best uh, person because he was annoyed. He was pissed off. He has weapons. Um, and now would you want to, <laughs> you got to think about it. Would you want to have your credit card run and then shoot everybody dead? Probably not the way you want to do things. I mean, you'd, but you know, there are people who go crazy and get really angry and you know, he could have had a weapon in the vehicle. He could have just gotten so pissed when he walked back out the door and seeing nobody else was around, just picked up his gun, walked back in and shot everybody. Could he have done that? Yes, he could have. And he might have been if they checked that if they checked that out and found out that the uh, the uh, camera was the timing was five, six, seven, eight minutes off. And I said, well, he could have made it. Let's take a look, bigger look at him. Um, yeah. Uh, but then you, I have a trouble getting past Noel Lee and the fact that he changed his story. There are no tickets to be seen. 
and that he that he didn't call from his cell phone and walked into a uh, to the uh, to the actual murder scene, take, risking his life if he didn't know the killer was in there, and also knowing the mechanic was in the back and actually saying that the mechanic was dead. So those are the reasons that he became, to me, a more interesting uh, suspect than did the last customer. Oh, well, thank you very much. And love to Egypt too. <laughs> One day I'll get back. I've, I've been, to, for those who don't know, I've been to Egypt twice, uh, once for a discovery show, which went well, by the way, on uh, Cleopatra. And I went back also to do my studies on Cleopatra to write the book I wrote, uh, The Murder of Cleopatra. So yes, maybe one day I'll get back. So I did enjoy it. Um, let me see what else we have. Uh, anybody else has any comments before I close out for the day? Uh, thank, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's, I say it's a very kind of exhausting case um, and somewhat hard to explain, but um, you know, I say, I hope everybody goes and actually reads all the details on it and, um, uh, you know, and, and therefore starts understanding that, um, that what the, the, the claims that, you know, that Colop is uh, guilty of mass murder is not true. And, uh, you know, and sometimes when I say he's not guilty of, of super bike, people get real upset. They're like, oh, but he's a horrible. I'm like, yeah, he's a serial killer. <laughs> you know, I want him in prison for the rest of his life. I wanted him to get the death penalty on this case, but he got out of it. And now he's, he's got, you know, he's made his little friends and he's gotten to be on, you know, to talk and be on camera and all that stuff. So he's gotten fun. I have not actually the yogurt shop murders. Uh, I, ha I you know I remember hearing about that case, but I have not actually looked into it, but that's a good one. I'll, I'll put that on my list as something to, to, to look into. Cause uh, yeah, it's been, that's been years. What is that? 30 years now? I think on the, the that one. And here, your Amber points out, people do snap. People don't actually snap. They just get pushed. Uh, in other words, you don't do something that you're not capable of doing. In other words, I'm not going to snap one day and suddenly shoot down everybody and, you know, the Dunkin' Donuts down the block because they gave me the wrong coffee yet again. <laughs> and they do all the time. Now I have to, I can't even drive away now. I got to peek into my coffee cup to make sure it's Oh, it's, is it really black or did you put the cream in again? Um, but I'm not going to suddenly shoot everybody there because uh, that's not in my nature to do so because I'm not a violent psychopath. Um, so people don't actually snap. What they do is they already have ideation. Um, ideation is a really weird thing. And I point this out to people when when you, um, when you, uh, when, wait, oh, sorry, oh, sorry I'm just, <laughs> uh, when, when you're looking at, um, crimes of passion, as people call them. There's no such thing as a crime of passion. You can't do anything you do not visualize prior to doing it. It has to be something in your in your, your mindset. Um, everybody, before you do any action, actually, you, you envision it. You say, okay, I'm going to go to the store. In your mind, you see the car, you see the store, you see the road to the store, and then you jump in your car, drive down the road, and go to the store. So you actually, even for a second, have something in it that tells you this is what what, what I could do. Um, I've never thought of doing certain things in my life because I don't have any desire to do them. I mean, I just don't have any desire to do them. Um, I have to really force myself to even think about certain things because there's just no way in God's earth I'm going to do those things. Um, but there are people, if, if I used to ask these kind of questions about like, let's say you, this is one I always use. Let's say you arrived home and you arrived home and you found your, 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 a significant other in bed with somebody else in your own bed. What do you do? And people have different commentaries. Some people just say they just quietly walk away. Some people say they would scream. Some people say they would throw everything in the room. Some people say they would punch somebody out. Maybe they punch the significant other. Some people would punch the person who was in the bed with a significant other. There are some people who say they would get a gun and shoot them. Now, I do own, I do own a weapon and I've owned a weapon for many years. Never in my life have I ever thought, if I found somebody in bed with my significant other, I would kill them. Never have that has that thought ever gone to my head that I would go in and actually pull out a weapon and shoot anybody. Never. Throw things around the room, yes. <laughs> Shriek, yes. That I would do. But never have I ever thought about shooting anybody. But you'll see a person that'll say, if I ever found my wife home, if I ever came home and found my wife with anybody, I'd kill her. Pay attention to that. And if you're with that dude, pay attention to that. So we, there's no such thing as snapping. Um, so there, but there is a where you already have the tendency to do something 
or lean in that direction, that then when things go bad, you will then possibly go in that direction. Ah, you live in Chesney. Oh, wow. You follow this case closely over the years. I really enjoyed the stream today. Thank you. Oh, well, you know, it's, it's hard to have been there. And, and you know, that the case was huge, huge for many years. Do you find, I'm curious, um, do you find that people are satisfied now? They're just, okay, um, Todd Colop, he did it. It's all over. It's done with. Do you find that that is true, that there's very few people questioning that he actually committed this crime? I'd be curious to know what you think of the people, what people are thinking down there. Um, uh, well, could have been paid and someone said something to, well, I'm trying to figure out where that came from. We could have been paid. Then someone said something to him. Oh yeah. Well, if you're talking about the last customer, he, there was an issue. There really was an issue, but still. And if he was already an angry guy, is it possible? I mean, it's pretty extreme. You know what I mean? It's pretty extreme. Usually people do things like like punch stuff out first or, you know, throw something. Uh, going out and getting a gun and coming right coming in and killing everybody, it's just pretty extreme for that kind of thing. Uh, usually it does require a great deal of falling out, uh, a great deal of anger, like how dare you, how dare you exclude me from your life? How dare you keep uh, keep me out? And that was one reason that uh Certain people were looked at because there was supposedly this issue where uh, it was said that Noel Lee um, was not supposed to come there anymore, that they had sort of banned him from there. For, it, for They had issues with him. Now, he will claim that's not true. Uh, but, you know, that was one of the reasons he was looked at or he was the information was out there. Let me put it that way. It does again doesn't mean he did it. But where are the tickets? I keep going. For, and I, I believe that um, during a little Facebook conversation once he. Uh, he, he still didn't explain where those tickets went to. So, which I thought was interesting. Couldn't come up with that answer. Oh, oh, thank you, Kat. I'm enjoying your audible book, Killing for Sport. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you like it. I, I wanted to get rid of a lot of the myths that were out there. Um, oh, thank you. Passionate. Well, yeah, about some of these things I am. I don't know how brilliant I am, but, uh, <laughs> you know, one of the fun things about doing this show um it's like, this is kind of like almost a stream of consciousness, you know, type thing for me. Um, I know that I could put in 40 hours worth of preparation and all kinds of fancy stuff, but you know, quite frankly, it's just, you know, I'm not, I'm not really wanting to do that. Uh, really what I want to do instead is just be able to reach out to people, have conversations to see how, show people how, how things really go down and how people really think and how crime stuff really works um, in a way that just is accessible as opposed to being, you know, so academic, academic. Um, oh, re oh, really? Well, that's interesting. This is our friend from Chesney. No, most people I talk to don't believe it was him. Interesting. That is very interesting. Because, you know, being outside of uh, South Carolina now, um, haven't been back since uh, <laughs> Sheriff Chuck, Chuck Wright, uh, you know, doesn't really want me in town. Um, Kind of didn't want to roll back in. Uh, but, you know, the family's accepted this deal. And, you know, that kind of blew me away as to why the families would believe this if it was Todd Colt. I don't know why they would believe it. They know. They knew from the beginning that he was not telling the truth the way it was. They had seen my blogs. They had seen me put out the information. And yet, for some reason... They all went along with it, and I do not know why, and I wish I did know why, but uh, I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue. You know, uh, there are a lot of things sometimes in life you just don't really know what, what the issue is, and um, it's frust it's very frustrating. Um, it's very frustrating to me, And but, you know, what's worse is that somebody is out there. Uh, I don't know who it is. Uh, again, it, it could be my number one suspect. It could be my number two suspect. It could be a third suspect that I don't know anything about. Somebody, but you know, here's the issue between the last customer and the arrival of Noel Lee. Um, let me see if I, I just see if I can find that one for you. Um, da, 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 where is it? Uh, okay, there was a point about how much time had passed. So there really wasn't, uh, I don't know if I can find it because 
Okay. Uh, okay, the last call was placed. Wait a minute. When did when did? He, yeah, I'd have to go look through all of this. My God, there's as I say there's so many pages. But in other words, the last customer left, and then a very short period of time passed from the time he left. Let's see how does this work? To the to the uh, from the time he supposedly would have left until the last shot was fired, uh, and then Noah Lee shows up. So it's it's in my paper. It's in my paperwork here. Um, shooting six place around two fifty. Two fifty is the last. Okay, two fifty is when the last the last shot is fired. Lee places the nine one one call at three twelve. So we're talking about. 10, let me count, <laughs> okay, wait, okay. 22 minutes max, 22, min, 10, 22 minutes max from the time the last shot was fired to Lee showing up, 22 minutes. So you would actually have to say, and it wasn't many minutes before then the last customer left. So you'd have to say the last customer left and right after the last customer left, somebody else ran in, shot everybody and then ran out and then Noel Lee showed up. Was there another person who was in there? And of course, okay, let's say it was Todd Collip. Now, according to that, then again, he's supposed to be sitting on a motorcycle for an hour and nobody saw him. And he wasn't the last customer there. So where did he go while the last customer was there? You know, where was he then? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know. Where, where did he go to? Uh, did he hide in the bathroom? Oh, that, you know. Where was he? And so the last customer left and then he popped back out, committed the crime and then ran off and Noah Lee showed up. And these are things that um, that the police should have really, really worked harder at figuring out. And when I presented some of these issues, um, they didn't have the answers. And that that was very, very concerning. Um, Phil, Philby says, I found it when he's he said he thought they were playing a prank. Very strange. That's a weird prank. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could be so stunned that you, that you just couldn't like get it through your head. Maybe. I'll, I'll give him a, a little bit of, <laughs> you know, thank you for this, Pat. The way you look at things is encouraging me to expand my own way of thinking, loving your life. Ah, uh, yeah. And, I, and I, that's why I hope people, you know, Think outside, especially when you have the media who's controlling a lot of the ways you're thinking sometimes. And that's what they do with a lot of these shows that they're putting out there these days. What they're doing is they're presenting it in such a way that, oh, you're supposed to buy it. So like so like in this this Devil Unchained thing, you know, they they present my evidence uh, about the about the gunshots uh, to the forehead and the and the uh, the the crime the 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 ballistics being backwards with him uh, and the, 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 uh, the, um, the magazines, the wrong magazines and all that. They present that really quickly and not really clearly. And then they go to John Douglas and say, what do you think? He goes, yeah, that's meaningless. <laughs> and now we're all supposed to believe that we're all supposed to go away. So John Douglas said it was meaningless. So it must be meaningless. Uh, and this is, this is the stuff that's really sad because you know, if the media, the media who used to be the watchdogs, the media is supposed to be a watchdog where they could, they're finding things that are incorrect and they're and they're and they're they're stopping it. You know, they're bringing it to the public's attention. Uh, but now, instead of putting it to the public's attention, what they do is want to manipulate the public so that they get more viewers. And it's a cool story. Uh, so yeah, so Devil Unchained is a cool story. Sure, I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that come out which are cool stories with lots of cool music and and you know maybe they have actors playing parts so you see people pulling guns out and doing these oh look they're committing crimes and oh how scary it all was oh, you know and then they have the interviews with the victims and oh it's so so sad you know and they use people to get their ratings but they don't necessarily go for the truth and that's what offends me terribly much in that you know it's right away what's interesting is why wasn't i there you know, I'm not saying this because I think I have to be a part of every show that ever existed, but considering I was the profile who actually worked inside the police department and, and, and spent all that time on the case. And if they wanted to present my material, 
why the hell didn't they just let me present my own material, <laughs> you know, instead of they presented it. Now, I might have turned them down because I don't trust them. Uh, but I would, if they had asked me, I could at least say, well, they asked me, they read my stuff and they asked me and they could have used my name. They could have said, well, we read Pat Brown's work. We, she was unable to be on the show, but we wanted to present the work. That would have been honest. And, and then not just bring John Douglas on and knock, knock it down, but actually do something in depth with him. But, but they didn't. Um, and I, one of the possibilities is that John Douglas and I don't see eye to eye on things. So it's very, they might've had the choice. You can have Pat Brown or John Douglas and they went with John Douglas <laughs> and he's like, well, if I'm coming on, She's not coming on with me. I mean, that's 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 a likely situation, which is unfortunate to, but to be like that. But I wouldn't be surprised. But the simple fact is the truth was not the issue. But again, I'll repeat one more time. At least they brought up the issue of nobody was shot in the forehead. And But yet you would think once that was out there, every media people should have jumped on that and started talking about how the police lied about that that he did not know something he and the police only knew that the police lied about that whole, that whole thing that he, that what, that's what proved he was the killer that they lied. But where was the watchdog media? They weren't there. Fascinating. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you, Veronica. I'm so down to earth. I don't know any other way to be. <laughs> that's just me, you know, but uh, also, I, you know, it's, it's one of the great things about YouTube is that I, Nobody controls me. So I can say what I wish to say and I can say everything that I want to say. So at least people can hear it and then they can, they can think for themselves uh, whether there's any kind of, uh, oh, <laughs> you're so nice. I go for Pat Brown any day. Oh, that's very nice. But I do, I do want you to be able to think for yourself. And, and I do try to provide the evidence, not just my opinion, but the actual evidence and so, you know, you can't argue with evidence when I, it wasn't my opinion that nobody was shot in the forehead. The evidence proves, by the way, of the autopsy reports that no one was shot in the forehead. It wasn't my opinion that the police misled the victims. No, the police did mislead the victims, families and the public by telling the media and telling the families that they were all shot in the forehead and that, and that Todd Cole had, that Todd Cole had knew that. So I, these I'm presenting exactly... Like, oh, thank you, Annie. <laughs> you too. Have a great rest of the day. Yeah, I'm going to try to cool off. Um, and, and, you know, but that's that's why I say the evidence should present evidence. Don't just present, you know, wishy-washy stuff. So the ballistics are in the evidence. Uh, all of my ballistics are proven. Uh, which magazine was used first? Which magazine was used second? Uh, what, what the ammunition was, uh, whether it was brass or whether it was nickel. That is in evidence. Um, and now how the order with their, which they're shot, that is my analysis. You could say that's my opinion, but I am basing my analysis on the actual evidence of where, who was shot with what, and things like the, the shots that were fired into the, the wall could not have been shot any place, but coming through those doors. So there's no way anybody went in there and shot the mechanic, just shot the mechanic in his body and then walked back through the doors. How did those holes get in the wall? Who, how did that happen? Well, it happened because at that point in time, he had the second he had the second uh, clip in there, and he was walking through the doors and was shooting when he came through the doors, and that's why the bullets went into the wall. That is evidence, and my analysis is based on solid evidence. So um, that's why I say I can disprove that he, that, that Todd Kolop was not. I can prove that Todd Kolop knows nothing about what happened at that scene. I can also prove with timing that he couldn't have been on the scene. Also, by the way, he he doesn't un, he didn't even know who was in the shop when he he supposedly was there. He he miss he didn't even know these people were there that were in the shop. So he couldn't even I, that was incorrect as well. And so ev literally everything he said was wrong. Um, he just has some basic stuff that was I believe fed to him. Um, either you know some stuff he knew from the public stuff and some things I think that somebody put in his ear somebody who knew my my profile who told him about my profile so you know oh no have i have i announced yet what my next live will be about no i haven't uh because i don't know i have no clue yet <laughs> the week goes by so quickly and i'm like what am i gonna do um and so no i don't so you have to wait probably i'll figure that out somewhere around midweek um have you, have I, Jenny asked if I've ever spoken to Todd. No, 
don't want to either. I don't believe in speaking to them unless I'm doing it for the police, unless there's a reason for me to speak to him. You know, I mean, he's a Todd Colip is a, is a pathological lying a psychopath. What purpose does it serve? He, you know, either lies to you on Monday or lies to you on Tuesday. So it really doesn't matter. And, uh, you know, uh, what was that question? Uh, oh, it would be interesting to have a video of your number one suspect without sunglasses. You know, <laughs> I just I just find it kind of funny that he wore the sunglasses. But, you know, because uh, people sometimes don't want you to see their eyes. Um, uh, but, you know, he's, you know, people, have, you know, we, you've had time. It's been a while since the crime. Um, and he's been on a number of shows. Uh, and you know, you can't get as much as you can from the very beginning. This is why I always go back to the very beginning. The same thing with witnesses, you know, you, your, your, your memory doesn't get better. It gets worse. So the same thing is true. You go back to what that person said when they first were interviewed. That's the most important statement they're ever going to make is right when they're first interviewed. And that's when you can do statement analysis. You can read what they say and go, that's, this is some interesting stuff, what they're saying here. Things aren't matching up. There's signs of deception. There's things that just don't work. Uh, and then they do a second interview and it conflicts with the first interview and they change the story completely. Then you, you look at it and you say, why did they change the story? Are they trying to cover up things like time frames and other issues? Um, so that's when you really want to look. You don't want to give them you know, years to come up with a good story. Although it's still sometimes interesting, I, I admit. So that's why what I would told Colop, uh, Colop, uh, Colhep, uh, or Colop, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name either. Uh, I don't watch a lot of TV, so sometimes I forget what the heck they are. It's not, it's not stuck in my head. Um, but, you know, he's tell, he tells different stories all the time. I mean, his stories change rapidly. Um, and again, you know, we're looking at what did he know from the very beginning? Did he say anything that made any sense? Or does he have time you know, to, to read my blogs <laughs> and figure out how the crime really went down? And now he's going to go back to the best because I know how that crime went down. And he'll start repeating what I said, you know. So um, actually, yes, uh, Veronica, I will be doing Jack the Ripper because I have already determined who I think the suspect is. Uh, I did that for Mystery Files. That's actually, you might be able to find that on uh, YouTube. Uh, Mystery Files, I did that show. I went to England, uh, London, and I did a show on Jack the Ripper. I am going to do one on Jack the Ripper uh, when I have time, but I have to go back over so many notes to figure out what I even thought back then. <laughs> you know, um, well, sometimes once you, you, know, you do the show, you do all your research, you do all your analysis, you do the show, and then, then you move on. So then I forget everything. And so I'm like, wow, what did, what did I ever think about that? So I do have notes. Uh, and so I will do that at some time in the future. So, so as far as next week goes, um, I'm not sure yet, uh, but I, 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 I am writing down what people uh, are telling me uh, that they're interested in and I'm making lists. And so, you know, I have a lot of time uh, to go through those on every Sunday and find, you know, work my way through what you're interested in because uh you know there's some some things some cases which i don't know if anybody's interested in but they're interesting to me uh but then again sometimes you come up with one that both of us are interested in and sometimes i hear of ones that i've never heard of anything <laughs> i've never heard before in my life you know i'm like oh wow oh the delphi yeah I, I the delphi murders yeah i have to look into that because what's happening with the delphi murders is a whole lot of nonsense and this is one of those youtube things that's gotten out of control where everybody's pointing at people and saying they're suspects when there's no evidence that they're suspects so i will I, I do want to take a look at that again um i did take a look at it a long time ago um but i just know that there's a lot of um you know very vague suspects that people are connecting like oh this guy i think he lives a thousand miles away but i'm sure he you know he was he was a uh, involved in it i'm like yeah not necessarily so <laughs> you know so one one has to watch out for when everybody becomes a suspect like you know and sometimes it's amazing i mean people literally come up with like jack the ripper for example jack the ripper they have suspects coming from across the you know uh, one is that he was american who came to london no he was not an american who came to london he was a guy who lived right in the neighborhood you know things that are just ridiculous uh but they make another story and and depending on who's got access to uh, getting a good media deal, um, they will write a book on it and then they'll they'll make ridiculous amounts of money promoting a story that has absolutely no validity whatsoever. But, you know, 
Somebody will listen to it and somebody will say, that's really cool. And it's so interesting. It's so fascinating. It's so ridiculously wrong. But if you don't care about the truth, you don't care about the truth. Uh, and so there's a lot of, there are a lot of things out there, which there is, uh, there's some really good, if you really fascinating cases, which do have evidence. And I, I, I try to do cases where there is evidence because if there's no evidence, I got, I've got nothing to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? If it's like, really, I have no clue. I'm not going to make up stuff and make guess complete wild guesses. There has to be some evidence that I'm going to be able to talk about to support any, any ones of my viewpoints. So, oh, he went to Whitechapel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it was an interesting place to walk to. And I got to pretend stab some, some, some mannequin in the <laughs> there when I was there. So it was kind of cool. I was like, ah, I got to feel like Jack the Ripper. Um, so, but I will, I will definitely do a thing on Jack the Ripper in, in the future. So. Lots and lots of cases, but I do want to pick ones that have some merit to them for me to talk about. So at any rate, I'm going to go for now. Uh, maybe I'll go back to the swimming pool. Hey, I got, I still got three hours of daylight left, I think. So I might go back and swim some more and I just have myself a nice evening. So I'm glad you all came here on this Sunday. And if anybody knows anybody and, and, and who is in the media, who actually wants to put out the truth, um, be my guest and send them to me. Uh, anybody can go to my website uh, or my Facebook page or find my phone numbers there. I'm not hidden. Um, they can always email me. They can call me. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, want, I'm waiting for the day where somebody really gives a crap about this case and, and the truth. So we'll see if it ever happens. <laughs> so good night, everybody. Uh, good night. Oh, well, that was very nice. And good night, Veronica. I like hearts. <laughs> See you all later. See you next week. Bye.